Welcome, good evening. I'm Pamela Franks, the class of 1956 director of the Williams College Museum of Art. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for the keynote lecture celebrating our new exhibition, Strict Beauty, Solowit Prints, presented by guest curator and art historian, David Arford. As we gather together, I want to take a moment to note we respectfully acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continued as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, which is where they reside today. We pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. We are truly delighted to share new scholarship on Solowitz's prints and process through this exhibition and its companion publication. Strict Beauty, Solowit Prints marks the culmination of over six years of research and study by David Arford and five years of conversations among David, Williams College Museum of Art staff, our colleagues at the New Britain Museum of American Art and the estate of Saul Lewitt. David initially approached Williams with the idea of organizing a compendium exhibition to his monograph because of our longstanding commitment to the artist's work with exhibitions such as Saul Lewitt, The Well-Tempered Grid in 2012 and the ABCDs of Saul Lewitt in 2008. That same year, the collaborate, uh, collaborative efforts of the Williams College Museum of Art, the Yale University Art Gallery, and Mass MoCA brought Saul Lewitt, a wall drawing retrospective to fruition. On view through 2043 at Mass MoCA, this extraordinary display of 105 wall drawings firmly established the Berkshires as a pilgrimage destination for fans of the artist's groundbreaking conceptual work and as the genesis of countless new admirers. For many decades here at Williams, the art of Saul Lewitt has inspired original dance and art performances, countless creative student programs, and close study in Object Lab. It continues to spark new ideas and nuanced responses to this day. As we look forward to the museum centennial in 2026, we remember with great fondness the artist's wall drawing 959 uneven bands from the upper right corner that was a joyful marker of our celebrating 75 years anniversary exhibition in 2001. On a personal note, the Lewitt family's warm and generous friendship over many years makes the presentation of this exhibition at Wickma especially meaningful to me and my colleagues. It is a pleasure to present Strict Beauty in partnership with the New Britain Museum of American Art, which is home to nearly a comprehensive holdings of Lewitt's printed work. The exhibition debuted in New Britain last year, and David's project would not have been possible without the collection, expertise, and collegiality of everyone there. David's in-depth readings of the entire scope of Saul Lewitt's prints have shed new light on the artist, giving the field much to consider and audiences much to enjoy. David S. Arford is professor of art history at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He's the author of Strict Beauty, Solowit Prints, the exhibition catalog, which was recognized as a finalist for the College Art Association's Alfred H. Barr Jr. Award. He is also editor of Locating Saul Lewitt, a volume of nine essays that reveal the full scope of the artist's wide-ranging practice and reassess his singular contributions to 20th century art. Locating Saul Lewitt was selected by Book Forum and Art News as one of the best art books of 2021. In addition, he is the author of articles and books about late medieval European devotional art and printmaking, including The Art of Empathy, The Mother of Sorrows and Northern Renaissance Art, and Devotion, the viewer and the printed image in late medieval Europe, and origins of European printmaking, 15th century viewers and their public. His current book project is tentatively titled Solowit Painting. 
It has been a privilege for Wickma to work with David on this exhibition and to welcome him this evening. Tonight's presentation will run about an hour. After David shares his talk, we will turn to Q&A, moderated by Wickma's Deputy Director for Curatorial Engagement, Lisa Doran. We invite you to share your questions for David through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom um, on the navigation bar. And if you need any technical assistance, feel free to send a message through the chat to our staff team who will do their be um, best to support you. Closed captioning is also available for this program and can be turned on and off using the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Now it is my great pleasure to turn this program over to David Arford to deliver his lecture, Reversals and Rotations, Solowit Print Strategies. David. So thank you very much, Pam, for that um, very kind introduction uh, and also for your great support of this exhibition here at Williams. My heartfelt appreciation also to Lisa Doran, who has encouraged this project from the very beginning. The entire staff here at the museum has been so welcoming and helpful to me, and I'd like to single out uh, Joellen Ade, uh, Nina Pelias, um, Keith Foreman, Rebecca Travis, Diane Hart, Noah Smalls, and the wonderful installation team led by Brian Repetto with John Burrow and Patrick Gerard. From the exhibition's first venue and main lender, the New Britain Museum of American Art, I thank Lisa Williams, Keith Gervais, and Gabby George. And finally, much appreciation to Janet Passell and John Levertu of the LeWitt Collection. And last but not least, uh, Carol and Sophia LeWitt. Thanks to all of you for making this exhibition possible. So welcome to the in-person audience and welcome to the virtual audience as well. And I look forward to your questions. I begin with two prints from the exhibition's opening section, a pair of lithographs that Solowit made in early 1950 when he was 21 years old. Created at the Hartford Art School, these prints are the product of a young artist full of confidence. A few months earlier, he had returned home to New Britain, Connecticut, after giving up on an MFA program at the University of Illinois, now determined to make a living not as a teacher, but as a practicing artist. The two prints demonstrate his commitment to perfecting his skills in lithography, a medium that he had first embraced only two years earlier as a junior at Syracuse University. He was especially enamored with drawing on the lithographic stone, which inspired, as he later recalled, a very graphic and much more experimental approach. As with his university prints, these two examples exhibit a variety of energetic mark making, from additive scribbles and layered shading to subtractive scratching and scraping. Soon after graduating from Syracuse in 1949, the excellence of his printmaking was officially recognized when his lithographs were included in a group exhibition at the New Britain Institute, which is now the New Britain Museum of American Art. And most significantly, um, when they were awarded uh, a $1,000 prize from the Tiffany Foundation. This award was life-changing for LeWitt, permitting him to quit graduate school, to spend a summer traveling uh, throughout Europe, and eventually to make his way to New York City. I open with these particular prints uh, because both include an easily overlooked detail. In the upper left and lower right corners, respectively, is a signature and date. Although LeWitt often signed and dated his early prints in pencil, the 1950s lithographs are noteworthy for the consistent appearance of a signature and date as part of the print matrix itself. To me, this development is the direct result of LeWitt's growing self-confidence now focused on pursuing an artistic career, a distinctive mark of authorship was required. These signatures also reveal Lewitt's understanding of a fundamental characteristic of most printmaking processes. In lithography, as well as etching, engraving, woodcut, and linocut, the printed image represents a reversal of the artist's original design. 
Thus, in this case, the two fighting men and the man in the top hat originated in drawings that are left-right reversals of the final image. And here I can digitally flip the images so you can see their ori original orientations as Lewitt drew them. In these flipped versions, you can also see what is required to include the signature so that it reads correctly. The artist must write it backwards. This same backwards writing is necessary any time leg legible words, letters, or numbers are part of the su subject matter, as with these two lithographs from 1948. On the left, note the station car call letters on the microphone and the glimpse of bold text on the poster. And on the right, the pay when served sign behind the bartender. In these examples, Lewitt has disguised or denied the fact of, rev of reversal that is essential to the printmaking process. Thus, the viewer is not conscious of it and perceives the image as a direct and seemingly unmediated visual expression. As my lecture title suggests, such fundamental aspects of the print medium are central to my discussion this evening. Twenty years would pass before LeWitt took up printmaking again in earnest in 1970. He was 42 years old and a far different artist than he was in his youth. His artistic reputation at the time was based primarily on his abstract structures and wall drawings. But it's clear that he had not forgotten the unique possibilities of prints. Indeed, he quickly homed in on, a cert on certain inherent technical and mechanical properties not available in other media, employing several print-specific strategies. Among the most productive was his use of reversal, as well as another capability of the print matrix, rotation. Through reversal and rotation, these manifestations of process and movement, LeWitt was able to create perceptually and intellectually rewarding experiences, ones that fully depend on the viewer's awareness of the subtle complexities of how prints are made. So, part one, reversals. In the early 1970s, Saul LeWitt created a series of etchings that combined, uh, combined text and image including several that strategically foreground reversal. All of these were made at Crown Point Press in California, beginning with lines not long, not straight, and not touching, uh, dating to his first visit in 1971. As recounted by Catherine Brown, the press's founder, LeWitt began this work by writing a line of text, wielding an etching needle, directly on the wax-covered copper plate. Assuming that the artist had little experience with printmaking, Brown warned him that his elegant cursive script would print backward. Of course, Lewitt, who was well-versed in printmaking, knew exactly what he was doing. The reversal of the text was what he intended, as a perfect way of making viewers conscious of the fundamental nature of the image above, an image that began as a drawing etched into a plate was, that was then inked, pressed, and transferred to a sheet of paper and thus reversed in the process. Through this act of, of reversal, explicitly signal, uh, signaled through the backwards writing, a complex conceptual and perceptual situation is established, one in which we are looking through the back of the original drawing and writing while imagining the view from the other side. Four years later, LeWitt again highlighted reversal in an etching entitled The Location of 14 Points. In this case, the image consists of lines that help chart the location of 14 points within the framing square, each marked with an X. Notice along the lower edge that LeWitt has written the title, his signature, the place, the press was then in Oakland, and the date, July 8, 1975. Of course, here the, re the reversal of the original design is even more explicitly indicated since backward lines of text stream across the entire print. This etching belongs to a series of works initiated in the early 1970s in which LeWitt visually and textually describes the location of various points, lines, or geometric shapes on the expanse of a wall, a page, or a sheet of paper. These wall drawings, artist books, pen and ink drawings, and prints typically consist of a straightforward diagrammatic image accompanied by directions that are often frustratingly convoluted. Our exhibition includes several examples, all made around the same time at Crown Point Press. Here, the location of a circle from a series of six etchings is described in a lengthy caption set in letterpress, 
and thus printed separately from the image above. It is difficult to read this text, uh, text without getting lost in the proliferation of incremental steps. It begins, a circle whose radius is equal to half the distance between two points. The first point is found where two lines would cross if the first line were drawn from a point halfway between a point, halfway between the center of the square and the upper right corner, and the midpoint of the top side to a point halfway between a point, halfway between the center of the square, and so forth. And that's just the first couple lines. The text's length and complexity suggest that Lewitt's goal is to defeat, or at least challenge, mental comprehension. Thus, as with much of Lewitt's work, the text-image relationship is central. And in this case, the tension between the visual and the verbal language is foregrounded. Concerning a related wall drawing, the artist once explained, I wanted the language to be as complicated and knotty, uh, like a knot, uh, and impenetrable as possible, but still being a direction for making a simple drawing. A layer of satirical humor should also be considered. As Lewitt added, in a way, it was a parody of some of the art being done at the time in terms of language. And here he's specifically referring to some of, the, uh, some of 1960s and 70s conceptual art that was criticized for its overemphasis of the verbal. The artist was also influenced by writers such as Samuel Beckett, who explored, as Lewitt put it, the idea of absurdity as a way out of intellectuality. In another related series, lines to specific points, Lewitt fully integrates the text with the drawing, which encourages a more explicit understanding of their relationship. Instead of separate letterpress text, he has handwritten the description, uh, descriptions in all capitals. Thus, he seems to aim for a certain level of clarity, precision, and legibili legibility. For these etchings, Lewitt worked against the medium's innate reversal by not drawing and writing directly on the plate. Instead, he drew the lines and wrote the words on sheets of clear acetate that were then flipped and transferred to the copper plates using a light-sensitive emulsion. In the final prints, therefore, the text is not reversed, uh, but reads naturally from left to right. With these uh, other prints in mind, all made within months of each other, the reversal of text in the location of 14 points becomes more remarkable and even more clearly purposeful. On the same day, Lewitt created a larger etching. Its title, The Location of Six Geometric Figures, is written at the top, and it, it features the geometric fig figures spelled out in the caption below, square, circle, triangle, rectangle, parallelogram, and trapezoid. Lewitt takes advantage of the shapes as natural frames for the texts, and at first glance, the print appears to be a potential commentary on the codependency of word and image. But a closer look reveals that the cursive text ultimately hinders seeing, quite literally overflowing from five of the six shapes, obscuring their borders. And more significantly, the words are again reversed. Thus, the opacity of Lewitt's language has been exaggerated by an intentionally subversive tactic that blocks comprehension, rendering the words impossible to read. Lewitt's reversal of the text in these prints has received very little attention over the years. In 1976, the art critic Brooks Adams characterized it in purely negative terms as an act of deliberate error and closure, and a move toward illegibility in contrast to legibility of the other location prints, uh, concluding that these prints represent the blocking of perceptual access by a willful act of unlearning. A decade later, Jeremy Lewison expressed a more measured interpretation, uh, recognizing the artist's gesture as an arcane attempt to engage the spectator, requiring a mirror to decode the message, thus becoming an extension of the artist's love of games and detective stories. Even though viewers may be initially confused, there is, as Lewison suggests, an element of fun uh, in deciphering the clues. As I've already suggested, at a basic level, the reverse text is all, in all of these prints, ref, uh, reinforces the process-driven nature of Lewitt's conceptual art by making us aware of the material and the procedural fundamentals of printmaking itself. Yet in the case of the location of six geometric figures, 
the reversal of the Prince inscriptions does something more, but it is not simply an, an attempt to undo the function of language. When interpreted alongside the Prince's overall geometric and diagrammatic content, the backward writing reveals itself to be a clever, a very clever art historical illusion. Specifically uh, to the work of Leonardo da Vinci, who combined his distinctive backward mirror writing with diagrams and geometric drawings, such as the well-known Vitruvian Man. Long interested in early Italian Renaissance architecture and fresco painting, Lewitt created this print during a period when he was thoroughly immersed in the culture of Italy. Indeed, in the spring of 1975, so right before he made this etching, he had traveled to Rome, Naples, Milan, and Genoa, where he had an exhibition. And the following year, he purchased a house in Spoleto. In addition to its similar reversed handwriting, the location of six geometric figures is linked to Leonardo's practice of integrating word and image by graphically and conceptually entangling them. In both Lewitt's print and Leonardo's drawing, the two components tacitly acknowledge each other in the way the lines of text are defined by or make way for the intervening geometric shapes. Ultimately, Lewitt's goal is to link contemporary debates over language in conceptual art to historical debates concerning the relative power of word and image. By permitting the reversal of his already difficult text, he renders it indecipherable and thus on one level declares the image's primacy over the text. Of course, the Vitruvian Man is the most famous example of the Renaissance desire to unify different geometric forms as well as to unify, unify the human body with geometry. In the, years after creating, uh, in the year after creating the location of six geometric figures, Lewitt returned to Crown Point Press producing geometric figures within geometric figures, a series of 36 etchings using his standard six shapes, but now superimposed. These same geometric shapes are also the subject of several wall drawings from 1976, including wall drawing number 295, currently on view at Mass Mocha. As with his mirror writing, it's almost impossible to miss the connection between the wall drawing and the Vitruvian man, as Jacques Reynolds has noted. Recently, Francesco Stolchi has made a similar connection between Leonardo's drawing and Lewitt's large modular cubic structures, like this one specifically scaled to the human body at 63 inches. In the Vitruvian man, geometric figures and a man's figure are harmonized, which is not literally imagined by Lewitt, but definitely implied when you stand in front of wall drawing number 295 or stand beside or step inside um, his modular cube. Compared to the large scale wall drawings and structures and at a smaller scale and on a fragile support, the location of six geometric figures links us more directly to Leonardo's world, to the private, scholarly, scribal context of his drawings and his words, a place where a simple sheet of paper records the merging of art and thought. Part two, rotations. Of the various print-specific strategies explored by Lewitt, one strategy, the turning of the print matrix, or in some cases, the source drawing, a quarter turn or half turn, proved to be particularly productive, as demonstrated by several prints from the 1970s and the 1990s, examples of which frame the beginning and the end of our exhibition. These works, representing etchings, aquatint, and silkscreen, feature lines, scribbles, and brushstrokes, and most were produced from one or two and sometimes more plates or screens that were systematically rotated and combined in layers during the production process, resulting in a single image or an image series. And here I want to consider the repertoire of moves that generated them, as well as the notion that Lewitt's art moves or initiates actual movement that activates pictorial space uh, along with the perceptual space of viewers. While Lewitt's practice has often been compared to that of a composer, and in the case of these prints and their effects, a comparison to a choreographer is more fitting. From Lewitt's first use of rotation, its import as a system depended on its recognition by viewers. 
One of the most straightforward examples is bands of color in four directions and all combinations, a series of etchings LeWitt made during his initial visit to Crown Point Press in 1971. In this case, the entire series is the result of only two square plates, one with a band of parallel lines across the middle and the other with a band of parallel lines from corner to corner. With the rotation of a quarter turn, the first plate could print both the horizontal and the vertical bands, as in the first and second prints of the series in the top row, while the second plate could print the diagonal band from left to right and the diagonal band from right to left, as in the third and fourth prints. Assigned black, yellow, red, and blue, respectively, these four orientations, the titles four directions, were maintained throughout the series in all two, three, and four-part combinations, culminating in the layering of all four color bands. Although the artist uh, may have initially been attracted to the idea of turning the print matrix as an efficient shortcut that saved time and labor, the procedure was also a way of extending and refining certain aspects of his systematic serial practice. The plate becomes a unit or module that can be rotated as part of a series of permutations, not unlike Lewitt's lines in four directions or the cubic elements of his many modular structures. In addition, the reuse of the same plates ensured a level of uniformity and control in terms of his vocabulary of lines. Compared to wall drawings, which rely on drafters to execute specific types of marks in a consistent manner according to the artist's instructions, in print form, Lewitt's lines could be permanently fixed on a plate, a stone, or screen, and then uniformly replicated, as well as combined and or printed in different colors or orientations in a potentially endless series of iterations, all accomplished for the most part without the artist's involvement. Indeed, in a 1974 interview, Lewitt stated, I use the medium of printmaking as a fabricator. I do a minimum amount of work, and I give it to the printer to complete. In this way, he was following the same approach he used for his wall drawings and structures, in which a motivating idea was ultimately realized by a team of drafters, uh, carpenters, metal workers, or masons. Bands of color in four directions in all combinations is the product of a minimum amount of work on Lewitt's part. After his initial act of drawing on two plates, the medium's role as fabricator was activated, as the series is primarily the work of the master printer Catherine Brown, and the methodical and relatively mechanical procedure of printmaking. Brown simply followed Lewitt's directions, as summed up by this quick pen and ink drawing, in which she laid out the order and the orientation of the bands, their colors, and various combinations. Examining the etchings in person, it is fairly easy to figure out the reuse of the plates and their systematic quarter turns. This is revealed mainly by the lack of total uniformity in the hand-drawn lines. Although Lewitt used a straight edge, his lines vary in terms of spacing and density and include noticeable skips and other flaws, which make explicit the repeated use of just two plates. The evidence of a fallible human hand is a hallmark of many of Lewitt's prints, particularly his etchings and lithographs, since a slick perfection was never his goal. During the same visit to Crown Point Press, Lewitt created another etching series, scribbles printed in four directions using four colors. This, is also, this also uses a system of four colors, four orientations, and all combinations. But in this instance, the series was produced from one seven by seven inch copper plate, the surface of which Lewitt covered in a dense web of scribbled lines. This was the artist's first use of this visual language and a striking departure from his signature straight lines at the time. Only through closely studying the first four etchings in black, yellow, red, and blue does one realize that a single plate has been employed and rotated a quarter turn with each color. Brown recalls that she was at first mystified at the scribbled lines and the turning of the plate, but Lewitt's rotational system became clear for as Jeremy Lewison notes about the series, although it is impossible to systematize a scribble, the printing of the plate is systematized. As the scribbles are layered in every two, three, and four part combination of color, their orientations defined by the first four prints are strictly maintained. And depending on the color combination, the layers of scribbles rotate a quarter, a half, 
or three-quarter turn relative to each other. By the 15th and final print, which includes the superimposing of all four colors, the cumulative mesh of lines represents the complete rotation of the plate's drawing, incrementally in quarter turns with each layer, and thus in four directions. Since LeWitt allows us to see through the layers, we can test the evidence of rotation, most obvious in the lack of any alignment of the overlapping scribbles. And in theory, we should also be able to recognize the repetition of lines and distinctive passages of drawing as we scan vertically, horizontally, and diagon diagonally across the print. With the two-bar combinations, this is um, possible to a degree, especially along the edges. With the final layering of all colors and directions, however, the density of chromatic and uh, visual information defeats any complete optical understanding. It is impossible to visually disentangle the separate layers due to the etching's small scale, the overall meshing of lines, and the shifting tonal values of the colors. While we, we may understand the system at work and have confidence in its implementation, by the end of the series, we're lost in a bewildering visual experience that is anything but systematic. Three months after making the Scribble series, Lewitt traveled to Dusseldorf, Germany, where he produced the lithograph lines not long, not heavy, not touching, drawn at random, circle in four colors, printed in four directions. The print's circular arrangement of delicate lines, roughly nine inches in diameter, relies on only one pen and ink drawing on paper that was transferred to four lithographic plates. As with the Scribble series, the drawing's density and scale dictate a very particular kind of visual reception. The viewer must move in close in order to see the superfine squiggly lines. In this case, the drawing has been multiplied and layered in Lewitt's standard uh, primaries plus black. With each color, the drawing was rotated a quarter turn, thus spinning the original order of discrete lines into a chaotic uh, swirl. The title's directive, not touching, references the original drawing and its rules, which are completely broken in the process of making the print. In this case, the procedure is easy to reconstruct due to the title's explicit instructions in four colors and printed in four directions. In addition, compared to the four-part combination of the Scribble series, the overlapping marks are not as densely drawn, and therefore it doesn't take long to notice several identical straggly lines repeated in each color at quarter intervals along the circle's periphery. Uh, and here I point out the repeated red and black lines along the periphery. Regardless of these telltale clues, as John Paletti has astutely noted, uh, quoting his words, the lines become an impossible tangle once we move in from the edge. And thus, vision is confounded, regardless of how simple the concept may appear. In this way, the print reflects Lewitt's willingness to let chance or accident have a role in his art, even giving the perceptual experience the upper hand. As he asserts in paragraphs on conceptual art from 1967, conceptual art is not necessarily logical. The logic of a piece is a device that is used at times only to be ruined. Logic may be used to camouflage the real intent of the artist, to lull the viewer into the belief that he understands the work, or to infer a paradoxical situation. Some ideas are logical in conception and illogical perceptually. My understanding of the conceptual and the perceptual complexities of Lewitt's use of rotation was greatly clarified in 2016 uh, when I attended a revival, a, a revival of Dance, Lewitt's 1979 collaboration with Lucinda Childs and Philip Glass. And I'm showing you the program for the original performance at the Brooklyn Academy, Academy of Music. In a New York Times preview article, Jennifer Dunning wrote, one couldn't ask for more like-minded collaborators. And indeed, the work of Childs and Glass um, was often described in terms that were identical or very similar to those applied to Lewitt's art. In an earlier uh, review, for instance, Dunning praised the intelligence in forming child's conceptual dances, emphasizing their use of repetition uh, and geometric spareness, with phrases repeated in combinations varied by timing, direction, sequence, ordered with mathematical precision. The process of creating dance began in the summer of 1978 when Glass first shared the musical score with Childs, 
who then choreographed an evening-long suite of five solos and ensemble dances. In terms of Lewitt's contribution, the artist insisted, I was not interested in doing sets or decor, but wanted to do something of equal status with music and dance. Thus, he and Childs decided that he should make a film to accompany three of the five dances. After enlisting the help of filmmaker Lisa Rinsler, the performers were filmed in a television studio from various angles. And for the actual performance, the resulting 35 millimeter black and white film was projected on a scrim so that its action was synchronized with that of the dancers. It was Childs who suggested the use of the scrim, essentially a transparent curtain at the front of the stage, which permitted the layering of the live dance with its filmed counterpart. Lewitt's goals for his film were clearly articulated from the beginning as he told Jennifer Dunning. I wanted to do something that would really analyze the movement, that would bring the dance closer to the audience. Although he originally mentioned the influence of the photographer Edward Moybridge, he later also referenced cubism, especially in relation to his desire to present, as he put it, simultaneous images from different viewpoints. In her art form review of dance, Deborah Pearlberg described the overall effect, comparing it to contemporary avant-garde theater, writing, it's a complex, active form of viewing, highly demanding. Instead of duplicating the live performance, the film radically alters that experience through overlapping, fragmentation, freeze frames, shifting scale and viewpoint, while also reinfor uh, reinforcing the stage's center, sides, and corners, along with bodies constantly turning in space. In counter to the live staging, the film includes a gridded surface that clarifies the relative positions of the performers and the dance's organizing structures. Interpreted in relation to Child's choreography, Lewitt's film is not only a demonstration of a way of creating through its fragmented and layered aesthetic, but also a way of seeing, of paying attention, of visually understanding. As such, it harmonizes with Child's choreography, which was known for its use of repetition, doubling, mirroring, diagonals, symmetrical formations, and the geometric plotting of space. Although her dancers often perform basic repetitive movements, such as skipping, jumping, and turning, these moves are all in the service of an intricate design of spatial forms. It is this overarching design that is clarified by Lewitt's film, which permits viewers to see the dance from multiple angles, from the front, but also from above, from the sides, from the corners, and even from the rear of the stage, sometimes combining views through split screen or superimposition. Thus, over the course of the performance, the film expands the audience's visual capabilities and parameters by layering and multiplying the live action, as well as essentially turning the stage. Lewitt's understanding of dance's choreographic language and structure was facilitated by diagrammatic scores or spatial maps that Childs prepared for each section. For the third dance, she indicated paths of movement primarily with diagonal lines and intersecting arcs, which are, are very similar to the visual vocabulary featured in many of Lewitt's wall drawings from the 1970s and beyond. This was a language in which he was well versed, and he wanted to, his film to echo Child's choreographic drawing, as he said. In addition to her diagrammatic notation for dance, Child's created a set of five pen and ink drawings, one for each section. In her drawing for dance three, Child's combined her sequential notations into a single image, overlaying all the paths of movement along diagonal lines from corner to corner and sweeping arcs that are doubled and intersecting, resulting in a perfect circle with a blossoming flower-like form at its center. A geometric structure never seen on the stage, but essentially drawn for the audience over the course of the performance, a product of movement, vision, and memory. Lewitt's film highlights and reiterates these movements and spatial pathways and thus heightens a temporal awareness of the dance's fleeting moments, allowing them to linger and accumulate before the eyes and in the minds of the viewers. As I said in the audience uh, for the 2016 revival of dance at the Joyce Theater in New York City, it became clear to me that Lewitt's cin uh, cinematic contribution was undoubtedly informed by his use of rotation in various prints and print series from the early 1970s. 
Following his collaboration with Childs, however, it would be over a decade before he returned to the strategy of rotation in printmaking. Of these works from the 1990s, several aquatints and a silkscreen seem particularly inflected by his experience working on dance, most noticeable in the new ways in which the turning of the print matrix reveals itself to viewers. Instead of a step-by-step -step development of layers that depends on delicate and densely drawn lines, these later prints are larger in scale and much more painterly in their mark making. One of the simplest forms of plate rotation is represented by brush strokes in different colors in two directions. A series of six sugar lift aquatints printed by Patricia Branstead and published by Riverhouse Editions in 1993. The technique of sugar lift was fairly new to LeWitt at the time. It involves a mixture of water, sugar, India ink, and soap that can be brushed directly onto a plate. The resulting aquatint retains the distinctive look of brush strokes and is characterized by tonally rich, transparent hues that are similar to watercolor. Although not immediately apparent, the series depends on a typical Lewittian system. Each aquatint was produced from the same six copper plates. One plate for the solid background in yellow, red, blue, gray, black, or white, and five additional plates for the brush strokes each printed in one of the five remaining colors and then rotated a half turn, 180 degrees, and printed again in a different color and order. Thus, the title's two directions represent identical vertical brush strokes originating from opposite sides, that is, the top and the bottom of each sheet. A dynamic contrast achieved not in the act of making the marks, but only in the act of turning the plate. Scale to the human body, the long brush strokes, almost four feet in length, record Lewitt's physical presence in the full sweep of his hand and arm. And the combination of the papers, uh, paper's velvety texture and the aquatint's tra transparent layers uh, creates a sensuous cascade of well over uh, 20 different colors. In February 1997, Lewitt spent a productive week at Crown Point Press working with master printer Darius Wallach and making 10 Sugarlift Aquatents. As with the Riverhouse Edition series, the Sugarlift uh, sugar technique allowed him to work directly on the plate using a brush to paint gestural marks as documented by this photograph. Among the works produced during the 1997 visit um, was short brush, brush strokes color, which was printed from one 30 by 30 inch copper plate, which Lewitt covered in short curving brush strokes. The square plate was printed in four colors, the primaries plus black, and rotated a quarter turn with each color. The final image is crowded with visual information as the four part combination of the scribble series. And of course, like the 1971 print, the same drawing has been layered on itself, spinning around its center. Since many marks go beyond the plate's edges and the overlapping transparent colors visually chop up the individual brush strokes into sections of green, orange, and purple, the evidence of rotation is especially obscured. Yet extended viewing of the print, which is much larger than the 1971 etchings, reveals glimpses of identical marks along the sides and from layer to layer, and an overall impression of balance or harmony although this is dependent on an elusive, almost subliminal perception of repeated brushstrokes, intersections, and shapes. Thus, the image inspires more than an optical experience. It seems to visually enact a mental state defined by shifting levels of consciousness from its topmost surface to its nebulous depths. During the same visit to Crown Point Press, Lewitt produced um, several large rectangular prints, some featuring short curvy brush strokes, and others a continuous meandering band, uh, the working proofs for which are tacked to the wall behind him in this photograph. According to Catherine Brown, after the plates had been proofed, Lewitt was concerned that the images were too similar to the work of Keith Haring. This is certainly the case with the proof for black curvy brush strokes seen on the left. Um, Lewitt's solution was to layer the image by rotating the plate a half turn and printing the image on top of itself. In the final print, the open paths of negative space are fractured and blocked um, as the winding black brush strokes overlap and intersect. Unlike the perceptual confusion of short brush strokes color, 
The turning of the matrix is much more obvious here because of the fewer layers and rotations. One way of confirming the rotation is by scanning the print from corner to corner. Every part of the image is doubled, most easily recognized in the white negative spaces. While at first the print seems nothing but a jumble of lines, its larger scale magnifies what is difficult or impossible to see in the earlier prints. That is an underlying structure. Once this is acknowledged, the image becomes organized, held together through layering, doubling, and an emphasis on the diagonal axis. Now perhaps the most spectacular example of Lewitt's use of rotation is the silkscreen brushstrokes in all directions made in 1994. The work of, uh, this work was printed by Hidimi Nomura at the studio of Joe Watanabe, who was involved in over half of Lewitt's print projects. In this case, the silkscreen began as a drawing in, on, in ink on acetate, um, composed of mostly, mostly straight, short brushstrokes in all directions, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal. Using a light-sensitive emulsion, the drawing was transferred to two screens, for the first, oriented as it was drawn, and for the second, flipped or reversed. Uh, so here my themes of rotation and reversal come together. Each of the two screens was printed in yellow, red, blue, and gray, which reads as a kind of dark black here, for a total of eight layers. For the yellow and gray layers, the relationship between the two screens represents a reversal of the original drawing from side to side and top to bottom, respectively, resulting in a mirror relationship. For the printing of red and blue, the procedure involved rotating the two screens a quarter turn in relation to each other, a step seemingly designed to create an even more complex weave of layers, as well as to heighten a specifically diagonal mirroring of colors and brushstrokes. The complicated relationships established between the print's eight layers appear to parallel those of Lewitt's, um, that Lewitt codified in uh, 1968, his drawing series, which relied on a system of rotation as well as what the artist termed mirror, cross and reverse mirror, and cross reverse arrangements of quadrants of lines. In the silkscreen, the original drawing's reversal and its complete rotation, clockwise and counterclockwise, become more evident in the print's overall symmetry. This is noticeable in the identical marks along the edges, where the exact same brushstrokes in different colors face each other and overlap in the center of each side, red and gray on the top, yellow and red on the right, gray and blue at the bottom, and blue and yellow on the left. But the symmetry is most clearly asserted by the topmost layers of gray, particularly in the starlight form radiating from the middle. Even though the yellow, red, and blue layers are mainly obscured, the series of moves, quarter turns, half turns, and reversals can be reconstructed through a visual and mental reperformance. As with Child's drawing for dance uh, number three, a geometric structure emerges, one built from overlapping circular movements and the constant turning around a central axis. Child's uh, choreographic diagram records the collective movements along certain spatial routes, as does Lewitt's uh, print, its series of moves accumulated in layers. Even more than Child's drawing, however, the silkscreen represents an all-over use of space uh, within a roughly square area with just a few specks of paper showing through, a pictorial equivalent of Child's characterization of her dancers as space eaters who consume space in a patterned, comprehensive way. If we pursue the, uh, this dance analogy further, uh, contrasts are revealed. Unlike Child's, who carefully plans her dances, uh, her dancers' movements so that they conform to her preconceived structures, Lewitt's choreography allows for the play of chance, as his brushstrokes interact through unpredictable intersections of form and color that create a lattice of mirrored shapes and structures. In his Sentences on Conceptual Art from 1969, he declared a certain level of unpredictability as essential to his practice. As he wrote, once the idea of the piece is established in the artist's mind and the final form is decided, the process is carried out blindly. There are many side effects that the artist cannot imagine. This relinquishing of control was maintained over Lewitt's entire career, at least in principle. About the appearance of his early wall drawings, he suggested that even if he had a notion of what they would look like, often they're different, and that's what I like about it. 
It's something I didn't imagine ahead of time and couldn't foresee. Of course, for the viewer of brushstrokes in all directions, the situation is reversed as one works retrospectively to imagine the procedure that resulted in the image. This involves a peripatetic kind of thinking and viewing, as Lewitt demonstrated in his film for dance. Not only must one see the print's marks in total, but also from multiple vantage points, in close-up, from each side, and even from behind. Furthermore, the use of transparent yellow, red, blue, and gray inks creates more than just layers of the same marks, but the mixing of colors at countless points of intersection, resulting in various oranges, greens, and violets. Thus, the repeated brushstrokes are fractured into a multiplicity of new marks. While the facts of rotation and reversal can be perceived, they are largely concealed from view. As with the final print of the Scribbles uh, series and short brushstrokes uh, brush color, Brushstrokes in all directions prompts a perceptually challenging dialogue between the artwork, the artwork and the viewer, not unlike the experience of some of Lewitt's structures, as well as many gouaches and other prints, in which certain elements are partially or completely hidden from view, and yet a system can still be deduced. It is this merging of an intensely optical experience with an intensely mental experience that is at the heart of Lewitt's practice. And it is clear that the artist imagined an ideal viewer, or in his words, an avid viewer, who wants to de decipher the work's original idea, along with the entire process that went into its making. Early in his career, when asked about the importance of knowing the method or system behind his art, Lewitt at first replied, oh, it isn't important at all. It's only important to me. All you do is see it. Yet a moment later, he reconsidered, saying, with any kind of art that involves this kind of method, there are several levels. You can look at it purely visually, but then you can either figure out the method or have the method figured out in some other way, either with words or drawings or somehow. For the avid viewer, brushstrokes in all directions is a kinetic puzzle and a multi-layered kaleidoscopic dance. Its sequence of movements carried out by a cast of identical brushstrokes clad in yellow, red, blue, and gray, gesticulating in every direction, making new colors as they intersect, following the same paths but from different sides and sometimes in reverse, turning and turning a steady whirl around the center, seeming to generate chaos but revealing a beautiful structure within. Thank you. David, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I know um, our audience members are, are gathering their thoughts and, and, uh, uh, and questions, but I thought I would just start by asking, you mentioned uh, Watanabe, you also uh, mentioned Catherine Brown, and I'm just interested if you could say a little bit more about Re Lewitt's relationship with the printers that he worked with. Um. Well, these relationships were very important. Obviously, I mentioned Crown Point Press throughout. I think almost all the images that we looked at were made at Crown Point Press, except perhaps the mm -hmm. silk screen. Um, so uh, Brown, the initial visit was in 1971, and he made repeated visits over the following decades. It was a very productive site for him. It's where he f made his first etchings. And uh, Catherine Brown has a very hands-off approach to working with artists. Um, she doesn't collaborate in any way. She just facilitates the creation of the prints, um, giving them um, an array of technical possibilities um, and then engaging with them in terms of how hands-on they want to be. One thing that I can mention uh, while we're talking about Brown and Crown Point Press is that um, an important aspect of Lewitt's printmaking in terms of uh, lithographs, etchings, and aquatints is that he always worked directly on the plates. Um, and I think this is something surprising to many people that know Lewitt's work, mainly through the wall drawings or through his fabricated structures, is that these are very hands-on uh, works where we see his hand uh, and his uh, individual mark making. And that was very important to him um, and was important to him throughout his career. But working with Catherine Brown was very productive. Um, uh, eventually, 
He worked primarily with Joe Watanabe, who established a studio in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. um, and thus was his uh, Lewitt's go-to person for producing prints. Uh, but he worked with Riverhouse Editions uh, as a publisher, uh, uh, also with Landfall Press in Chicago, and with many different master printers. And this is really a, an atmosphere of cultivating printmaking with artists that started in the 60s um, and a different kind of approach so that artists didn't have to necessarily be trained in printmaking, uh, but they could work with master printers that could facilitate uh, creating prints. That, that sort of leads to an, a, another question that we have from the audience, which is about the, the sort of seeming desire um, of Lewitt to want to recede from the making process in the prints, um, kind of leaving the creation portion um, to the workshop. Mm -hmm. And the question is sort of about, um, you know, if you could comment on this studio practice, uh, you know, the, of a master artist of the past, you know, kind of thinking about a master painter um, and the reliance on a studio to execute the work. Now, that's a very good question, especially um, in relation or in the context of our knowledge of Lewitt's interest in art history and uh, the way artists practice in the past. But his move was essentially uh, one that fulfilled the goals of his conceptual art uh, to create distance um, between himself and the final product. Uh, thus, by uh, using um, um, a set of rules or a predetermined system and uh, letting that idea, um, um, just kind of setting it in motion, uh, in this case in the print studio, was a perfect way of backing off from the work. Um, this was a way to make sure that he didn't, didn't interfere too much and insert too much of his own personality or emotion. Um, but there is a kind of contradiction because of the prints that I just mentioned, uh, the lithographs, etchings, and aquatents, where he has hands-on involvement uh, so I think he liked being able to um, have more control than he did with wall drawings, for instance, where he wasn't always pleased with the outcome. So here he could be involved enough so that he could make sure that the lines were drawn the way that he wanted, for instance, in the early pieces from 1970 and 1971, uh, and then just let his lines, his own lines, be multiplied into more lines as the series was created. So. I think there's an interesting tension between control um, and distance mm -hmm. that uh, printmaking fulfills in a way that his other modes of art production did not, as well as many other print-specific things that I think are revealed about his use of prints. So on that note, too, in terms of the um, other modes of production, especially wall drawings, um, can you talk about how often Lewitt did the same image in a drawing um, for a print and a wall drawing or actually a similar imagery that would kind of cross these these modes? Yeah, I think um, our exhibition is full of surprises um, mm -hmm. visually, but there are overlaps in terms of his linear vocabulary and geometric vocabulary with the wall drawings. So often depending on what's happening in his, uh, his work overall in terms of um, abstract um, uh, visual languages that he's introducing, um, the prints will reflect that. But it is important to notice in the exhibition and in the catalog, there are many prints where he's doing something that does not appear in the wall drawings at all, or there'll be um, a print where he's rehearsing an idea um, and then it eventually becomes a wall drawing. So there's a great example included in the catalog of um, a set of prints made by art students at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. And he sent them directions to make 10 lithographs. And when Lewitt arrived to sign the works, he was not happy with at least two or three of them. And the reason was that he felt the students had worked against his directions. Um, so he actually modified the directions for two of those ideas. Uh, and when they were converted into wall drawings, uh, the directions were clarified so that he would get the result that he wanted. Um, there are also examples in the exhibition, uh, for instance, a print called Whirls and Twirls, Color, um, that was made after he had created a wall drawing in Italy for a library. And it's actually not on a wall, it's on the ceiling of this library. And it's a beautiful um, 
it almost looks like a stained glass or um, you know, it's clearly referencing Baroque uh, ceiling decoration as well. Um, it's swirling and it's moving and it's made up of really bright opaque colors uh, painted in acrylic paint. The print, of course, is at a totally different scale and is wall-based. Um, and the change of scale uh, means that it's something totally different, of course. It's a different image. It's been flipped from the image on the ceiling, uh, reversed, and it's, uh, it's a beautiful line of cut. And um, it makes you look in a totally different way. It's a much more intimate and up-close experience. And it sets, it resonates uh, with uh, the history of art and visual culture in a different way. So in the exhibition in the catalog, that particular print really reminds me of uh, medieval illuminated manuscripts or small scale metal work where there's intricate linear design. Um, so I'm uh, really interested in the way that the prints reference aspects of visual culture that the wall drawings and the structures don't. Yeah. Well, that, that last um, reference that you just made uh, leads to another question from the audience. Um, and that's about the connection between your study of medieval art and analysis and appreciation of Lewitt's art. A good question. And I'm a confusing scholar because I have these two areas. Um, I think um, for me, having been trained as a medievalist and I worked in the 15th century, which is kind of this in-between century. Um, so it was late medieval or is it early Renaissance? I'm very used to being kind of stuck between things. And I, um, most of my work is on early printmaking in Europe, so 15th century devotional woodcuts mainly, um, which uh, before I started working on them, they were truly a marginalized uh, area of study. So I'm used to the marginalized quality of printmaking. And I think in Lewitt's, uh, the scholarship on Lewitt, prints were always kind of shoved to the side. Many people don't even know that he made prints. Um, for instance, when he had his really spectacular first retrospective in the United States at MoMA in 1978, um, no prints were included in the show, but they had a separate show at the Brooklyn Museum of the prints. They actually mentioned this in the catalog in the preface. Oh, by the way, we didn't have room for the prints, but you can go see them in Brooklyn. Uh, but there's no analysis or any writing um, on the prints. So, Partly, I guess I'm saying I've worked on marginalized things, and I don't mind working on that. Um, but also, I think you know I have a bit longer view. So mm -hmm. maybe uh, since Lewitt was such a fan of uh, fan of the art of the past, I think that overlaps my training. So I can kind of engage with that in a way maybe it hasn't been done in the past. And also, I'm so interested in material uh, aspects of these prints, mm -hmm. and also the the optical or the the viewing situation. Uh, that they uh, create. Um, because most of the devotional prints I dealt with were ones where people were engaged with them in a very personal way, um, often writing on the prints or painting them or cutting them up and collaging them. So I'm very intrigued by those questions too, material questions. Yeah. Um, have you actually uh, deciphered the text on six geometric shapes and similar prints? In terms of is that your comment on material things, and this is something um, someone's wondering. I have not done that, but I trust that Lewitt did that. Um, so, for instance, <laughs> the location of a circle that I showed you, and I read just the first couple lines. Um, I know because of the Crown Point Press archive in San Francisco. Uh, I've looked at the working proofs for that series, and I, re I reproduced at least one of them: the location of a triangle in the catalog. And Lewitt actually checked every word of his captions, and he actually made sure by drawing on the proof of the print, um, using a ruler and drawing extra lines, he made sure that it matched the directions. So Lewitt later, I mentioned, referred to them as a kind of parody or a reference they had a kind of satirical dimension. And this cer cer certainly is part of what they are, but he took them so seriously. Um, he also said uh, at one point that they were his poetry. So um, if they're just a one-off kind of parody, that would be one thing. But he made many uh, of these kind of location works with these very long convoluted directions. 
Yeah, and you're saying seri uh, so seriously, but there is this kind of humor, right? Like this kind of underlying Definitely. humor. That's <laughs> I hope that came through. If yeah. you actually attempt to read the entire thing, wow, I admire you, but you know, be ready to be lost and confused and yeah. Um, I, we have time for maybe one, one or two more questions. I don't know if anyone in the audience has any questions. We have a mic if, if you do. Um, if, if not, I mean, and you uh, mentioned a, cup, a couple of instances and you said, our, you know, there are a lot of surprises on our show. And, and since we started this conversation, um, what, six years ago now, mm -hmm. something like this, and you were in the early days of your research, I guess my question for you would be, you know, what, what were some of the most surprising things that you, that you found as you embarked on this sure. project? There are many, but I think one side of Lewitt that's revealed by the exhibition, several of the prints in the exhibition, is a more personal, um, emotional, um, socially engaged artist. And this was something that he very specifically denied about his practice, that it wasn't about himself or about society. It wasn't political. Um, but there are you know, two or three moments in the show, for instance, in um, the first gallery that starts with prints uh, from the 1970s, um, he made a series of prints that are connected to a wall drawing, wall drawing 46, which is vertical lines, not straight, not touching. And uh, he created that wall drawing in Paris, um, right as he learned that his friend and fellow artist, Eva Hesse, had died. And he dedicated this wall drawing to her and said that it borrowed from her aesthetic and combined it with his. And it's made up of freehand vertical lines, not straight because they're freehand and they're not touching. He's trying to control that aspect. To me, they're the most vulnerable and human kind of mark making that he made. And um, that wall drawing has never left his collection or the collection of the estate. Uh, but has been, been included in every retrospective. And he made a print a month later uh, that's on display and then made a series of three more prints. And one of the uh, prints uh, afterwards is made up of vertical lines, not straight, not touching, but they're white floating against a black background. And uh, this is from a portfolio called Conspiracy, the Artist as Witness. And it was an anti-Vietnam portfolio of prints designed to raise money for the Chicago Eight, their legal defense. Um, and their vertical lines, not straight, uh, not touching, this very personal um, vocabulary that he dedicated to his friend becomes a kind of political way of speaking, um, you know, about war, about, you know, uh, the litany of days that America, you know, America was involved, uh, the body count that was on the front page of the New York Times at the time, you know, every day or every week, uh, a kind of tally of the war dead. I mean, it's, it's really quite moving to me. Um, and uh, the statement he wrote for the portfolio uh, was very brief, but he essentially s said something like, um, you know, my feelings are, are clear or something like that. Um, you can see in the catalog, I'm sorry, I'm not quoting it exactly. And um, he actually, uh, wanted to change that language. He didn't like the fact that I think that he had revealed too much, that, oh, suddenly this piece was going to be about feelings and emotion when it's really just about a kind of conceptual idea. So I think that, along with, uh, for instance, the symbolic use of stars mm -hmm. as part of his geometric language, is fascinating, that he was open to the idea that these stars would um, overlap meanings that he knew well in both uh, uh, the East and the West, uh, cultural, uh, symbolic, religious meanings attached to them. Wonderful. Um, I guess one of, uh, one of the questions from the audience was, was did, did you know him personally? No. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I started my project um, after he passed away. And um, it really began with one of his uh, engaging one of the first, last things that he did, which was designing the exhibition at Mass MoCA. Um, so that exhibition opened in 2008, uh, the year following his death. And I've gone every year, sometimes more than once. And it opened my eyes to um, 
Lewitt in a way I had never really understood before. I always thought that he was extremely cool and detached and there wasn't going to be much to look at. And yet it's all about looking. It's so visually captivating and full of interesting uh, experiences for a visitor. Um, and then I found out that he made prints and that really hooked me in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, you were done then. Um, one last question. Where is the ceiling drawing in Italy? Um, I can't remember the exact region, mm -hmm. uh, but it is in our catalog, a uh, yes. reproduction of uh, the ceiling. Okay, yeah. well, we'll, we'll get that. I think it's Reggio Emilia is the province. Okay, yeah. well, we'll make sure that our, uh, our audience member gets that information. Um, all right, um, David, thank you for this. This was absolutely enlightening, and, um, and we're just so delighted, as Pam said, to have this exhibition on view at the museum for the next few months and to continue to have uh, these enlightening programs with you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if anyone has follow-up questions, feel free to email me. I'm easy to find online. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.